Thank you, Dr. Oleski. We have um, a group of students representing our special ed department who are putting on a presentation for us this evening, so I'd like everybody to uh, give them your undivided attention. Present the structured learning experience program, which is at the high school, and it is. Thank you. The structured learning experience is an evidence-based program where the youth with disabilities. It has been proven that youth who have an opportunity in their high school years to go out into the community and practice employee employment skills um, are proving to be more successful in their post-secondary <coughs> cases. So uh, we have our students who've come to uh, give a a. Tell us what's going on. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Um, SLE is an experience-based program um, where core curriculum standards are taught in natural settings. So my, Mrs. Moskowitz and myself thought what better way to present the program to you tonight than to have the students themselves present. So. Hi, I am Sam Roth, and I've been in the SLE program for two years. Throughout this school year, Mrs. Moskowitz and Ms. Mitchell move us to different sites where we have many different community job site experiences. This is me at Bioshine. At Bioshine, I work in the office. In this picture, I am filing invoices by, by company name after I just organized them in alphabetical order. I use my reading and thinking skills to complete this job. Mrs. Kraft, my job coach, has given me, tr has given me tricks to help me do this job accurately. Sunrise Assisted Living has been a part of the job site program for many years. Here I am working in the kitchen. I have learned to do many different things such as putting frozen pies on trays and egg washing them, making muffin batter and scooping them into pans, preparing croutons, burger patties, and bacon. I have also learned how to make french toast batter, egg salad sandwiches, and cakes. Donna, the kitchen manager, leaves us a list and with the help of Mrs. O'Connor, our job coach, we complete the tasks. Before being in the SLE program, I didn't think I had an interest in working in retail, but after trying out TJ Maxx, I found it interesting. In this picture, I'm working with my job coach, Mrs. Small, learning how to hang and censor the clothing according to the procedures of the store. I am finding this work challenging as well as rewarding. By being in the job site program, I have learned multiple skills. I have learned that I like completing many different tasks at a site instead of doing the same task over and over. Last year I worked at the district's human resources office and transportation office doing computer input. This year, Joyce said transportation and me trained the new student workers learning the job. From being in the SLE program, I already know what to expect in a job setting and what is expected of me. When I graduate from high school and enter the adult world, I will be better prepared. Hi, I am Limar Gabigas. By being at the job sites, I am learning how to be independent, ask questions, use comments correctly, and work to be a, the best I am able. I work hard and working makes me feel happy. One day, I hope to earn money when I am an adult. The job sites help me learn how to be a good worker. I work at TJ Maxx too. <coughs> TJ Maxx has been part of the SLE program for many years. We learn many different retail tasks at this site. Here I am matching and organizing shoes by sizes. Another job site I have is the clothing center which is new to the program this year. I need to wear work clothes at the clothing center. I concentrate and focus to find the tags and the shirt sizes. I have to be very careful doing my work. <laughs> I listen, follow, follow directions. 
えっ、と、<笑><笑> I don't <laughs> yell when my job coach corrects me. <laughs> I, have, I have learned how to act when working out at job sites. I have to work together with other people. I have to ask questions and tell them what I am doing. It is important to communicate with others. Hi, my name is Tyrone Hartman. The job site program has taught me that you must always look professional and always be respectful to your coworkers and also be polite to them. Because of the generosity because of the generosity grant from the East Brunswick F Education Foundation, we all have polo shirts to wear on the job and our helping hands project began. Thank you. We follow directions, pay attention, and focus on our job. Ferris Farms is a site we go to in the fall and spring. At Helping Hands Memorial School, we do copying for the teachers and put the mail in the right mailboxes and shred the papers. At Helping Hands at the administration building, we shred papers make, and make copies and deliver the mail. At TJ Maxx, our tasks let us help people. We put the shoes on the right shelves to keep them organized for the shoppers. We put the right size keeters on the clothes, hangers on the rack, which help shoppers find their size. We work alongside other, work, other workers. We are sorting the keeters for the size it up job. Hi, my name is Diana Weiner. I am learning organizational and time management skills. At Norman's Hallmark, I put reading cards in order and find where they go on display. I need to keep track of my time so I have time to put my materials away and be ready for the bus. I also have worked at the NCADD. I had an opportunity to learn data entry. I have become a responsible person. I learned to communicate with other employees and ask questions of them if I had a problem. I was able to work at NCADD without the support of a job coach because I learned the skills to be an independent worker. I also had the chance to work in a retail setting, but due to my experiences in SLE, I've learned a lot about myself. I have learned that I prefer to work in an office setting and enjoy having a job where I can use a computer and not be on my feet too much. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to put together a resume and cover letter. I have training in computers, filing, and communication skills. I know where I will be when I get a job in the future. Hi, my name is Nadine. Izzy Moore is author, long time job site. Here we help pull out the paint and yarn in the bin. I look at the numbers on the paint bottle to find where they go on the shelf. This has taught me to be careful and focus. I also feel the yarn, feel the yarn shelf. So, <coughs> My job site, I am learning how to be by my, myself, also asking for help when I need it. It's okay, we all need help sometime. Begin does how to be responsible will help me be a living person. I have learned the 
that I like to work. I have learned that I like helping people and that I am good at it. I work at Helping Hands Royal School in preschool <coughs> class, helping the kids in the classroom. This makes me feel good about myself, that so I can help them. I feel good and powerful. Hi, I am Erin Tregillis. The job site program has showed me that I will be able to have a job to make a living. It has given me more confidence to be the best person I can be. I feel I am more prepared to get a job once I graduate. Even adults with disabilities can have a job and live a good life. I have found that I like and don't like some job sites and after working at the East Brunswick Office of the Tax Assessors and the Board's Transportation Office, I have found my strength as an office worker. I've learned that I can be independent and I have the ability to work without a job coach. This makes me feel proud of myself. At the Transportation Office, I do the bus inputs all by myself. At the tax office, I scan the papers. If I have a question, I ask Joyce or Elena. I know what I am doing when I work. And I even learned that it's easy to talk to people when I have a question. These skills are going to help me in the real world. I am becoming a mature young lady. I am confident that I am going to get a job, live on my own, and socialize with my friends. Now I know those who think they can do it really can. All of us, <coughs> sorry. All of us in the, in the SLA program are learning by doing. We use our pro wait, I think I read that part, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, we use our problem solving skills, uh, problem solving, critical thinking skills, and communication skills every time we are out at a site, at the site. This program works to because of the partnerships we with the partnerships with local businesses our most our most current job sites include BioShine, TJ Maxx, AC Moore, NCADD -D, and also oh sorry Sunrise Assistant Living, Best Buy, Boston Market Helping Hands, Norman's Hallmark, Minuteman Press, uh, oh, Ferris Farms, Clothing Center, <coughs> Edible Arrangeable, Edible Arrangements, Voy Salon, a Cut Above Barbershop, East Brunswick Mission Wood Building, and YMCA. Thank you very much. We're always looking for more opportunities for our students. Every opportunity is a new one for our students. And if anybody knows anybody who is interested in becoming a partner with us, we are more than happy to take some information and get it started. Thanks, everybody. I don't know about you, but I think there's got to be a comment here about that. That was quite impressive. Well, we went, some of us went um, to visit. I believe we were there when you were doing a flower sale. Mm -hmm. And also, um, the day I was there, they were cooking. They were doing, um, I don't know if it was a dinner party, but they were, or a holiday. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they were doing a dinner party, and they all had different recipes. Some were doing laundry, so very, very impressive. You guys should be very proud of yourself. It was wonderful. Any other comments? 
and I think the businesses are so fortunate to have our students. Mm -hmm. I mean, they obviously are, you know, young people that are taking this responsibility very seriously. Their communication skills are phenomenal. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, they the work sites well. are, are, are very happy to have them. But we are very thankful to those establishments in the community that are giving our kids an opportunity to excel mm -hmm. and it just goes to show you that uh, it's one thing to work mm -hmm. on the job site but to be able to get up into a crowded mm -hmm. room and to be able to talk so eloquently just speaks to the to the the school and the uh, parents and everyone who's, who's gotten you to this point and I think on behalf of the board we're terribly proud of you and it just goes to show you that uh, as a community what we can actually accomplish no this is our version, I guess, of No Child's Left Behind. That you're, you're, we're all one. So thank you. That was impressive. Thank you. Very nice. And, and, from, and from the administration, too, I want to say thanks to the staff. We have just a great, dedicated staff that works very well with these young men and women. And I see them in the office frequently. Um, they blend right in. Mm -hmm. They're, they, they do a terrific job for us, so thank you very much. <laughs> We do have um, some reports and presentations this evening. We're going to start first with the structured learning experience. That's what that was. Oh, that was it? Okay. Now we're on to the energy savings improvement plan. Yes. Yes. So um, if um, Dr. Valeski, were you, did you want to say a few words? Okay. So um, I'd like to introduce Greg Samjan, Perrette Samjan Architects, District Architect, um, who will um, provide us with uh, an overview of the energy savings improvement plan. A little bit of background for the board members. Um, this was a conversation that was had at Finance Committee last month, and um, as a result of the discussion there, Finance Committee felt it beneficial to bring this presentation to the full board. Um, and so, without any further ado, Mr. Samjin. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm following up as requested to share with the full board the conversation we had at the committee meeting. And um, just some quick background. The Energy Savings Improvement Program was legislation that was put in place in 2009. And essentially, it's nothing more than a funding mechanism to allow districts to take money that they're presently spending on utilities, electric, oil, gas, water, and to implement more energy efficient projects that might include lighting, boiler replacements, things like that, and to use the savings from those projects to fund the projects themselves. So the, um, the first piece of information that I think is important to understand is if you look at the pie chart on the top, that would represent the utility spend in the district today. Whatever that number is, it's a few million dollars, it represents 100% of the utility. The um, energy costs, which are represented in blue, which are electric, water, and gas, and the red represents maintenance costs. So aging boilers, for example, your facilities team has to make improvements to those over the summer months, whether it's replacing pieces, tubes, things of that nature, light fixtures, ballasts burn out. So those kinds of maintenance costs are incurred on a regular basis to maintain your facility. And so that amount of money is being spent today and you're spending that money, as you can see from the pie chart, primarily paying utility bills. The bottom pie chart shows what this legislation is intended to do. And it is simply to take that same exact amount of money and that's what's critical to understand as part of this concept is you're not raising the tax to the community, you're not using capital reserve money, you're redirecting money that you already have in your budget that is being spent on the utilities and redirecting it through savings to cover the costs of the projects. So the size of the pie does not change, but what you see is the cost of the utility goes down and the cost of the maintenance goes down, and the delta is money that is used to pay for those improvements. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, 
most times when I get to this point, people always have the question about the chicken and the egg. Okay, I understand the concept, but how is it that I can get savings to pay for these improvements if I don't make the improvements and spend the money? And so what the legislation essentially does, and I'm going to take you through a quick flow chart of the process, but essentially what the legislation allows you to do is through a variety of checks and balances is to borrow the money to make the improvements, physically make the improvements, and then the savings that is realized, which is shown in that yellow pie chart, portion of the pie chart, that is the money that pays back the money that you use. Because the realities are that you do have to make the improvements. And I'll use lighting, which is right in the room and, and something easy to kind of follow along. Lighting has a very quick payback. Literally within several years, whatever you spend to replace the lighting, if it's the most energy efficient, you could get that payback within three to six years. And so obviously there's a cost that's incurred to replace the light fixtures throughout the district to make that savings and then as a result of that new improved energy efficient light fixture, the utility spend will go down. The legislation itself doesn't bring you money. All it is is a funding mechanism to allow you to pursue this process in what we call a budget neutral approach. You're not raising the budget to accommodate this. Again, you're not going to the taxpayer. You're using energy savings to pay for energy improvements. That's what the legislation does. And they realize that with our New Jersey aging facilities, that we've got outdated and inefficient equipment throughout our schools. And this is a way to really help districts who are trying to control costs, many that are capped at 2%, to try to deal with capital improvements that might otherwise be paid by capital, by budget, by referendum, by any of those things, you wouldn't have to, you can accommodate this. The flow chart is relatively straightforward, and I'll go over it very briefly and then certainly answer any questions. The process has a lot of checks and balances because they want to make sure that uh, processes are being followed. Essentially, the first step is something called a local government energy audit. There's a requirement that the district undertake an audit whereby an engineering firm that is specializing in this kind of audit would visit every one of the schools and they would prepare an audit of their findings. They will give you what I would define as a 30,000 foot overview of potential projects that could be uh, undertaken, the approximate savings that would be realized, and that's the first step. The beauty of the first step is that even though it's a requirement, the cost of the audit is 100% subsidized by the local government energy audit program. <coughs> so much so that after we apply with the district to the program and get approval, we send out a request for proposal to five pre-qualified firms in the state. Those firms will respond to the RFP. One of them will be selected they will do their audit and the state will pay them directly. It used to be that the district had to pay and get reimbursed, but now even cash flow has been addressed because the state pays through the government, the local government energy audit program directly. So the first step will not have cost the district a penny and you will have an audit on which we can make some general decisions about how to move forward. The next step can take one of two paths. There is something called the do-it-yourself model and there's something called the energy savings company model. Most of our clients are pursuing the process through energy savings companies, but the general concepts are the same, so I'll focus on those and then answer questions specifically about which road to take. After you have the audit, which is about a 30,000 foot overview, there is a requirement to create something called the actual energy plan. And the energy plan is a greater level of detail that is required that will identify each and every what is called ECM, energy conservation measure, and identify each potential project that the district can undertake district-wide. Examples include lighting, boiler replacement, and small things like caulking around the windows where maybe caulking has failed. Clearly, an expense like caulking around the window is significantly less as is the savings you will realize, but every piece is aggregated to allow for the overall project to physically work. 
<coughs> once you get the energy plan in place, it has to be reviewed by a third party. The third party is an independent professional not associated with the projects that will confirm that the calculations are right and that, in fact, the projects as proposed can pay for themselves. So if you look at the projects, the projects have a construction value, they also have a savings that will be realized, and those two have to mathematically work out because the law says that the savings must pay for the improvements. And so in reality, there's very little to no expense that the district will incur. The third party review is probably a few thousand dollars, and I don't believe that is eligible to come out of the savings to uh, pay for itself. But all of the construction, and in fact the design professional's fees, will all be covered by the savings. Once the energy plan is verified by a third party, assuming that it's perfect the first time, if it's not, There'll be a dialogue with the third party to make corrections. The Board of Public Utilities will also review it and ultimately sign off. And at that point, you have a plan, commonly known as an energy plan, that will show you the projects throughout the district that can be undertaken in a budget neutral fashion. And as the design professional, from that point forward, everything moves forward like any other project we've done in the district. Design drawings have to be created it gets publicly bid and awarded to the lowest responsible bidder. Once the plan is done, nothing changes from how any other construction project is undertaken. And ultimately, the objective is that when, the, when all the projects are implemented, you will start to see savings on your utility bills, and that is the money that goes towards paying back the debt. The, uh, what the law allows is for the district to borrow money up to 15 years, and in some cases, 20. Before this legislation in 2009, the only way you could ever borrow money for more than five years was to do a referendum. Five years were typically the longest period of time, and generally copiers would be an example of something you'd want to lease for a five-year period because that's not something you could afford to pay for in one year. Typically, when you were going to undertake a major capital project, you would have to fund that over multiple years. You couldn't do it in a, uh, a single budget year you have to use capital or some other form and so referendums are typically 15 20 25 years so this was put in place because the legislation felt and in fact has now proven to be true that when you incorporate more energy efficient equipment it does pay for itself and so literally it's a budget neutral approach and once you've paid back the debt the savings continues to be the districts that's kind of a quick overview of the energy plan just to give you some numbers large districts like yourselves are benefiting the most because from a conservative approach what we've seen is about 20 percent savings and that's a very conservative approach we've seen as high as 35 or 40 but if you take the utility spend on an annual basis and 20 percent of that that's the amount on an annual basis that you can afford to pay back again this is back of the napkin numbers but we have districts that are similar size to yours that are undertaking eight to sixteen million dollars worth of capital improvements and it's completely budget neutral lighting throughout the district with the most efficient lighting boiler replacement um, refurbishing of unit ventilators all of these things are possible and now that the the legislation has kind of evolved and a lot of the kinks have been worked out it's really proven to be a very effective tool to be able to manage and undertake these capital projects. There is one additional benefit, and that is in the first couple of years, there are still rebates and incentives out there when you implement energy efficient equipment. And so for one, two, maybe three years at the start of the project, we are still finding hundreds of thousands of dollars in rebates that we can secure for the district that will further subsidize some of these improvements for you. Those aren't cash that you know can last 15 years throughout the life of the project, but again, the Board of Public Utilities, the companies that are out there still incentivize people to make these improvements, and those rebates are out there as well for the first couple of years. That's kind of a quick overview of uh, the Energy Saving Improvement Program. We've talked a little about it at committee, and I was asked to come, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. This is Shaw. Um, <clears throat> 
My only question isn't necessarily for you, but perhaps for Mr. Giuliano, I'm not sure. But um, <coughs> many of the types of projects that you have mentioned to us uh, this evening are ones that we regularly try to budget for um, you know, over a period of years so that we know that, you know, one year we're going to replace a boiler at this school. The next year maybe we're going to do a roof at another school. Uh, the following year maybe we'll replace windows at an elementary school or something of that nature. How does a uh, plan such as this mesh with our own planning? Uh, I would say that um Something like this affords us a greater opportunity to do the kinds of things that we haven't been able to address. So, for example, the simplest example that, uh, that Mr. Samjin talked about was lighting. Uh, we've done lots over the years in terms of upgrading and, and becoming more efficient. However, as you know, technology changes constantly. So the most recent technology is moving lighting into the LED phase. We have a facility that we're in uh, progress on uh, on the Edgeboro Road maintenance building, which will be all LED, which will uh, bring back substantive savings. That's the kind of thing we want to move into with all of our facilities, not only interior, but exterior. So there are huge opportunities there for us to be able to make conversions, have savings, and, and really provide um, a superior system in terms of lighting alone. We can look at that at so many levels, and I think that's really what gets into what Mr. Somjan was talking about, and that's doing the assessment. Mm -hmm. Looking at specifically what we have, what the age is, and what are the benefits that we may obtain by planning replacements. You know, I, I look back to my early years here, and I, and I forget that it's been such a long time since, for example, we put a brand new heating system, state-of-the-art heating system, at the high school. Well, that heating system's pushing 20 years old at this point. Is it the most efficient? Probably not at this point. Um, it was state-of-the-art at the time. But things change, and we need to, I think, as a district, in order to ensure that we're maximizing the use of taxpayer dollars, explore whatever opportunities are out there to Don't the utility companies themselves <coughs> offer these types of audits? There are some, uh, but in this case, this is a much different level audit because this right. is also tied to a financing mechanism. Yeah, and, as a, and as an example, you know, the utility company may come and look at <coughs> the electric the utility, electric utility might come and look at your lights, but this audit addresses the building envelope, which has to do with insulation values. Because, as an example, if we tightened up the building envelope, roof insulation, windows, things like that, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the mechanical systems that we design in the building can be smaller because you're not wasting as much because the building envelope has been improved. And just to piggyback on what Mr. Giuliano said, the beauty of this program, because it's energy savings covering energy projects, it frees up your capital to do other things. When, so there are lots of things that are still not covered by this because they're not energy projects. As one example, we recently did quite a few security upgrades throughout the district. That's not energy savings. You can't use that money to pay for the security projects. I'm sure there's much more of those kinds of projects that the district would like to do. And so what you're doing essentially is freeing up the capital that you have or the money you budget mm -hmm. to do those projects rather than spending the money on the electrical upgrades or the boiler replacements, because those can be covered by the savings. But you would not, for example, be able to redirect any uh, funds to something other than capital projects, is that correct? No, absolutely. They, it would need to be reinvestments, essentially, in our facilities. Um, I'm not sure, I don't recall if uh, Mr. Samjin covered this, but there's a small portion of the savings that could be directed to other non-energy mm -hmm. um, savings projects. I think that's about 15%. 15 percent. So up to 15% could be directed to non-energy savings projects, but facilities related. So okay. we couldn't move the money to program or exactly. it has to be reinvested <laughs> in the facility. Um, and, because, and you have to understand that's a one-time <coughs> expense, and that's why you can't hire a teacher, for example, because it's a one-time expense that you're going to make the savings. So you could replace some door hardware 
for example, because that's not energy related, but that 15% could be used to pay down the debt a little bit sooner and things of that nature. They give you a little bit of flexibility there, but but it, it, it's primarily energy savings for energy projects. That's really the drive of six. And, and just to give you an example of scope, um, because uh, we, we, have a, we have an energy budget that is um, roughly $3 million. So um, if we were using the conservative, conservative end of the savings, and let's say uh, that was 300,000, uh, no, it would be about 600. So let's even take it less. $500,000 savings a year off of our energy budget. If you look over a 15 year period, we're probably getting about $7 million worth of projects done. It's not easy for us to be able to fund on a year to year basis. So it, from the conversations we've had, and this is for, for us administratively, this is probably the fourth or fifth time we're having the discussion. Finance Committee, as I mentioned, had this presentation last month and a discussion on it and, and felt that it was important for the board to hear this and have a conversation. But ultimately, um, there's no risk in doing the assessment. So it makes sense to see how can we best stretch that dollar that we have. We know the dollars are limited. So how can we best stretch it and come up with a plan that allows us to achieve needed facility improvements without impacting the bottom line? Um, Mr. Sergeant, you made a, a classification <coughs> to stay with the idea of lighting because I know there's different <coughs> classifications for the improvements that you had to make, the boilers and stuff like that, but you said that we get the biggest bang for the easiest return for the shortest period. Correct. So you mentioned that the classification just for lighting for purposes of payback was actually three years. I, I said three to six. Three to six. Well, let's, just, let's go on the other end of it, six. If we make all the improvements, we still have the efficiency of the lighting to move forward, correct? Even Absolutely. After the past six or seven years. Correct. Right. So in reality, not only do we pay it back, but we have the efficiency of all the improvements that we make for going for the forward. You are 100% correct. Okay, so when you talk about budget neutral, it's really budget more benefit later on where we wouldn't have had to make that bigger improvement in electricity for years to go. So. We really lower our electricity bill for the next <coughs> 25 years. <coughs> or let's say 10, 15. Con so conceptually, yes. and, and this is kind yes. of the unique component, you use the one example of lighting, which is three to six years, and right. that's on the shorter end. But we have to couple those lighting projects with other projects that are 20 year payback, and it's the aggregate that gets us the ability to do all of them. Okay. So you're really looking at 10 to 15 years of bonding in my experience because at the end of the day you're not just going to do lighting. lighting it's an opportunity to aggregate for example technically speaking roofs and windows are considered energy efficient projects the challenge with those is that roofs and windows are anywhere from 20 plus year payback so people always talk about we'll do what they call the low hanging fruit let's get all the little stuff done that's quick payback and I tell our clients to not look at it that way because if you do all those projects up front, you don't have them to offset the bigger picture items okay. mm -hmm. and aggregating is really the key to the success of this program. So it's the larger project. That's what you're trying together. to accomplish. Now, I can tell you that there have been occasions where we've gotten some roofs and some windows into the program, but the realities are those are the exceptions, not the rule. because costs of roofs and windows are so significant that they cannot pay for themselves. So we get bits and pieces or we subsidize it through capital so instead of spending a half a million dollar on a roof, we only spend 300 and we subsidize it through some of the savings. But you will find yourself, in my opinion, anywhere from 10 and there are certain circumstances and I won't complicate you with the details now, but under certain circumstances you are allowed to bound out to 20 years with certain program elements and we find districts taking advantage of that because you get an economy of scale, bigger bang for your buck doing these things. And the energy or would be able to tell us that. Correct. But conceptually, you're right. Once you pay back these costs, the end of the day, the savings will continue to be yours. But what you also have to realize is in 15 years, we'll the cost of electric is going to go up. And so you're back to kind of budget neutral. The benefit is you don't have to go to taxpayers to potentially raise it you're just back to where you were 15 years earlier because the cost of living and the cost of the utility has gone up. 
Thank you. I, and, and I would add something beyond that because it's not it's not that the cost of utilities continue to go up, which they will, but the fact is that technologies change. <clears throat> and so what we put into place in 15 years, by the time we get through a payback, it may be time to look at something different again. Right. Yeah. So it's a constant moving target. Facilities are never finished. They always need attention. It's just like being at home. You know, when we, when we, when you have a home, you have to renovate your kitchen, you have to renovate your bathroom, the pipes start to leak, the windows leak air, you've got to replace your doors. All those things are the same things we experience as a school district, but on a much larger scale. So this is a way to help us bridge the financial gap to deal with some of those issues. Are there any other questions on that? No. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, I'd like to take just a couple of moments and um, take this opportunity to respond to the request at the of the Board of Education to look into uh, the late early late school start time issue. So I'd like to read a statement and um, I have to start out that as a matter of history. The East Brunswick Board of Education was approached a little over a year ago by a group of parents advocating for later school start times. This group of parents have provided the board with numerous studies in support of their claims. They've also approached the PTAs, they've spoken at back to school nights, developed the Facebook following, and have spoken at several Board of Education meetings. To be fair, this group should be aware that while not as organized and vocal, the board has also heard from many parents who would oppose such a change in school start times. Many of these parents have cited, one, the need for our athletic teams to remain competitive and um, competing for scholarships is the only way that many families will be able to afford for college. Two, the need for after school employment, another example of students who need to save for college. And three, there are many two income families who depend on older children to help with the child care needs of younger siblings. Most of the studies that have been provided speak to the improved student outcomes in both tests and grades with a later school start time for teenagers, specifically at or beyond 8.30 a.m. Added to this are the claims of decreased depression, anxiety, motor vehicle accidents, poor eating habits, weight gain, and overall general well-being as a direct result of a later school start time. Let me be clear, we are not talking about increased sleep, a factor that few people dispute as an important, healthy lifestyle. We all know that increased sleep can be accomplished in more ways than to simply start school later. I've provided a few articles out at the table for those who are interested that I've reviewed personally over the last year on this topic. They speak largely to the multiple factors associated with teenage behaviors and sleep patterns. Considering the overwhelming number of students diagnosed and treated for depression, anxiety, ADD, ADHD, you would need a study powered by an exceedingly large number of students in order to prove that the only contributing factor was the start time of school. There are also studies that claim that what matters is not always the amount of sleep, but the quality of sleep. This can be de undermined by technology, including but not limited to cell phone use, iPads, computers, texting, television. In addition, a huge number of teenagers on medication for the above mentioned disorders often leads to lower quality sleep as they are amphetamines and stimulants. Since science is still in its infancy regarding the biology of the neural system, I'm afraid to jump to early conclusions. There are many examples when prestigious scientific communities jumped on the prevailing opinion of a few studies and ended up having to retreat later. I'm not saying that that's the case here, just that we must tread slowly and apply the same scientific methods of review that we teach our students. Per our in-house data, our results in East Brunswick do not show a benefit in academic performance at later periods, a time when neuroscience claims our students are more alert. 
There are outside studies which have also failed to demonstrate improved performance. Since we cannot rely only on the science, I can tell you with certainty that most of us believe that if there was a logistical way to implement a later start time, we would. There is no way that we want any child waiting for his or her bus or walking to school in pitch black darkness. As board members and parents, we always put the safety of our children first. This drives every decision we make. That's what you've elected us to do, and we take that role seriously. As you know, the State Assembly and Senate are conducting reviews of the later start time question. I'm unsure how long it will take for that review. Should the review support later start times, the process of voting on such a bill would commence. If such a bill were to pass, implementation would be simpler for us, as all districts would need to adjust their times. The effect on sports, after school programs, work, would be uniform across the districts in the state. At this time, we will not be implementing a change in the school start time. However, we recently added a strategic planning committee to the list of board committees. The purpose of this committee is to develop a three to five year district-wide strategic plan for the school system. This will include curriculum, technology, buildings and grounds, student services, finance, community programs, transportation, and policy. Any large successful corporation would do the same thing as we must continuously define the standards that will keep us at the forefront of education. The plan must be malleable enough to change with major shifts in the educational environment, but must serve as a guide for all future decisions. While this board will, will be it will be board directed, input will be needed from the community, that is parents, students when appropriate, clergy and township officials. It will have to include teachers, administrators and possibly consultants. I've asked Karen Famigletti to allow me to put her name in for consideration on this committee. The board has valued our interchange and see this issue as one part of a very large picture that we need to craft as a community. Please keep in mind that this process will require individuals who are willing to look at the whole district and all the components of what makes us a blue ribbon status program. We have a reputation for our educational programs and curriculum. This is arguably the single most important deciding factor upon which families choose to live here. We welcome the continued work on trying to start school later, but will not let one issue dominate our mission. I trust that this helps you and the community to understand the seriousness with which we have looked at the later school start time issue. So on behalf of the Board of East Brunswick Board of Education, I thank you for your efforts on, on behalf of our children. You, along with all the parents here in town, are the biggest reason why East Brunswick maintains its tradition for excellence in academics, athletics, and the arts. We'll uh, take about a five minute recess right now and um, reconvene at about nine o'clock.